Hey everybody, this is Kathy and I am here with Josh Bowerly, CPA and owner of JDB Business Solutions. Josh also happens to be my oldest son and um, Josh is with us this morning. He's actually in the very lovely state of Colorado and although it is sunny here in Ohio, we are freezing and he is here today to answer questions regarding our 2013 um, taxes, our filing our taxes. So, um, Josh, welcome. And before we get started, will you just tell us a little bit about your business? Yeah, so thanks for having me. Excited to talk about everyone's favorite topic, taxes. Um, just to tell you about my business, we got started about a year ago. Um, I was in a CPA firm, and I kind of noticed that small business owners didn't really have many options when it came to taxes. They could go to our CPA firm, they'd pay $1,200 to $1,500 for us to prepare their taxes and then get no help the rest of the year unless they wanted to pay a $250 hourly consulting fee. Or they could go somewhere like H&R Block which, or any of the other seasonal chain tax shops, which you're not really getting the qualified help you need. I mean, a lot of their preparers are people who had two weeks of, of courses to learn how to do that. And then you still wouldn't get any help throughout the year. So they were kind of stuck. Either go the cheap route with not a qualified person or pay huge amounts for a CPA firm. So I started my business to kind of try and be in the middle there and give them more options. I specialize in working with small business owners, with entrepreneurs, and our goal is to give them that qualified help they need from a CPA and also keep it affordable for them and give them help throughout the year if they need it at a rate they can afford. Okay, so gosh, really, that's, that's interesting. So you're saying the only difference between me and someone that works at H&R Black is a two-week course? A lot of times, yeah. Yep. Holy schmoly. Okay, well... Good to know. Um, I've heard already from several of our girls and several of my um, premier sideline sisters and senior leader friends, um, and they have asked the following questions. So before I have you break down like our deductions and such, I'm going to go ahead and ask those questions if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. So first of all, they want to know at what point should we use a tax preparer? Yeah. So in my opinion. As soon as you own a business, you absolutely should hire a CPA to do those taxes for you. First of all, the IRS estimates that the average small business owner who tries to prepare their own taxes spends 16 hours on it. So even if you know what you're doing and you're confident you're getting things right, do you really want to spend 16 hours doing that? I mean, how much is your time worth to you? That's the first question. The second thing is most people don't get it right. I mean, we've all seen, we just knocked H&R Block a little bit, but we've all seen their commercials that the IRS said people who prepared their own taxes last year left a billion dollars on the table. Okay, so a CPA is going to get you those deductions that you couldn't have gotten yourself, or they're going to prevent you from taking deductions that you're not entitled to, which is going to cost you money when the IRS comes back and says, no, you're not taking those, and by the way, here's the interest and penalties you owe. So we're either going to save you money getting you deductions or save you money from the IRS coming after you for deductions you couldn't take. Does that make sense? Yes, so, yes. Okay, yeah. so then is it, you know, a lot of people want to know, is it worth paying someone to prepare your taxes. Yeah, absolutely. Like we just said, not only do you have the time factor, you also have that you're probably going to miss something that you could have taken or take something that you shouldn't have taken. So in almost every case I've seen, people have gotten well more than their money back by hiring a qualified person to prepare their taxes. Have you um, ever found mistakes when you get a new client? And if so, like, is there like a leeway or a time period like that you can go back? Yeah. So. We do offer a package that where you go back and review it, and we'll, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, but we, uh, you can go back up to three years from the deadline of the taxes to get a bigger refund. Now, if you owe the IRS money, they'll let you go seven years to pay that <laughs> money, but if they owe you money, you get three years, okay? So your 2013 taxes are due April, four, April 15th of 2014, which means you have until April 15th of 2017 to go back and claim a bigger refund from your 2013 taxes. And we have found, just to give you an example, we did one a few months ago. We looked at his tax return from last year, which he tried to prepare himself, and he'd made a $30,000 mistake. We actually got the IRS to, to send him a check for $30,000. Now, most of you probably aren't making $30,000 mistakes, but, I mean, $1,000 here, $500 there, it all adds up, and it, you're going to get more back than you paid, generally. Okay, so that alone probably makes it worth it, I'd say. Um, the next question I hear is, they're asking, are you accepting any more clients? They're going to watch this, and they're going to think, well, gosh, I'd like to go to Josh. Are you even offering, you know, have any room? Yeah, we, we do have some room for new clients this year. We, we can only take on a certain amount each year. So if you are interested, please contact us quickly. But, yes, we are taking on a few more clients this year. 
Okay, and then what about your charge? What do you typically charge? Yeah, so I, I can't really give a price over this. It's so specific on your situation, how organized you are, what you have going on. I will say that I do give a 50% discount to Premier people from my typical rate, but we do offer a 15-minute free consultation to kind of give you an accurate estimate of what your taxes are going to be. So you know up front what we're going to charge you. Okay, great. So someone could call you, kind of tell you their situation, and you could say how much it's going to cost, and then they can decide. Exactly. Perfect. Now, the, um, the next question was, um, what do you offer any kind of a package for those individuals that maybe have more than one? Maybe they have more than one business. Maybe they have a business and their spouse has a business. Maybe they own properties. It's a little more detailed of a tax return. Do you offer a package? And if so, tell us about it. Yeah, we do. Um, this And this package would be for, like you said, people who maybe have more than one business, them and their spouse have a business, they have rental properties, or maybe their business is just getting very big very quickly and they want more help than just the tax return through the year, right? So what we do, are the first part of it, we're, we're going to prepare your 2013 business and personal tax returns. So if you have two businesses or one business, whatever it is, we're going to prepare the businesses and the personal. The second part is we're going to do what we talked about before. We're going to go back and look at your prior year returns and see if you made those mistakes over the last three years that could get you more money. Um, it, it, this would be especially true if you tried to prepare your own taxes. We'll go back and look at those for you, see if we can catch anything to get you more money back. The third thing is a lot of people, once they get to a certain point, they want to be in a business entity, whether it's an LLC, an S corporation, a sole proprietor, whatever it is. We'll look at that for you, tell you whether you should be in one, and then advise you on how to get started in that. And then the fourth element is we're going to give you 30 minutes of consulting every month for the next 12 months. So if in June you have something going on, you want to know what the tax consequences are, you give us a call. We'll talk to you about it for a half hour. You don't have to worry about paying an hourly fee. We're not going to nickel, nickel and dime you on that. So, so it's going to take care of everything you need for the entire year, and it's at one price of $995. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is true because sometimes I know like when we started our business before you were had your business, there were a lot of times when just getting my taxes done by a CPA, I really wanted to have that ongoing being able to talk with him. So that is that includes all that. Exactly. Yep. Perfect. And then lastly, um, the biggest question I'm getting right now is, well, gosh, I am looking for someone to do my taxes, but your son lives in Colorado. What do I do? So do you have clients that live out of state? How does that work? Yep, yeah. We actually, most of our clients are from places other than Colorado. Um, and the way it works is you can either just scan and email us your documents, which is what most people do, or some people don't like using the computer. They don't trust sending their stuff online, so they just send it to us by mail. Either one's fine, but we can, we can definitely work remotely. The great thing about that is you never have to leave your house. I know you mentioned how cold it is in Ohio right now. So yes. how great would it be to just just scan those documents, email them to us. We'll email your, your return back, never have to leave. So it's actually been pretty convenient for people. Awesome. And so then you recommend, I know you have told us the three things that uh, IRS wants are the three top things are documentation, documentation, and documentation. Yep. And so if we were to mail or scan or whatever, we should always keep a, a copy. Is that correct? Absolutely. And the, the thing is, you don't have to send us your, your box full of receipts. All we need to see are your final numbers. So however you get your final numbers done, you send those to us, you keep your receipts, and always keep a second copy of, of everything, whether you're sending it to someone or not. Okay, now that that helps answer those. Now let's talk about um, deductions. And speaking of receipts, what is the best method or organization on how to how to organize our receipts? What do you yeah. recommend? What's easiest when for tax purposes? Yeah, and this is pretty confusing for a lot of people who are new in their business. They kind of come to us and they have all their income listed as income and all their expenses listed as one big expense column. That's not the way the IRS wants it. They want to know how where you're spending your money. They want categories, okay? So you want a category of office supplies where you're going to put all your printer stuff and all your paper and all your ink and anything that could be categorized as office supplies you put into that category in one lump sum total. Um, your meals and entertainment, anytime you're, you're spending money on meals, you put it into that category. Your auto expenses into that category. Your phone expenses into that category. So you want to categorize your expenses. That's, that's the biggest thing people miss. Don't just give one lump sum, categorize them, and then total them. Okay, so then for in our business with Premier, then 
we would probably have a jewelry sh a, a, a jewelry show expense, like what our jeweler share would go into, maybe invitations we sent out, that type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Giveaways to our hostesses. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about um, the most commonly missed or possibly the unknown deductions. Yeah, so the biggest thing I see business owners making is they don't understand that now that they're business owners, all these expenses that they had before they were business owners could become deductible on their tax returns. So your cell phone, which you were paying well before you owned a business, now you're using that cell phone in your business, and it's at least partially deductible. So you, you have to do an estimate of how much you're using it business versus personal. Most people go somewhere in the range of 50 to 75% business, and then you can deduct that much off your total cell phone bill. So you paid $1,000 for your cell phone for the year, used it 75 for business, now all of a sudden $750 of that cell phone bill is a tax deduction, even though you had that well before you had your business. Same thing with your home internet. Um, you had internet before your business, but now you're using it in your business. So it's at least partially deductible. So I would go through and think of anything that you're using that you already had in your business, and we can try and find a way to deduct that for you. That's, a, that's the biggest thing I, I think people miss, and it's one of the biggest advantages of being a business owner. Okay, great. Well, let's, in fact, let's talk about meals. What do we deduct and how do we categorize that or whatever? Yeah, so they, they call it meals and entertainment. And this is any time you're spending money on meals or small entertainment things that you're taking your clients out to. Um, I know for guys, a lot of this is they'll take clients out to, to lunch and golfing. I'm guessing a lot of your jewelers aren't doing lunch and golfing, but there's probably things you are doing, right? <laughs> You're, you're taking them out to coffee, you're taking them out to lunch, taking them out to dinner. Maybe sometimes you do take them out to a movie or a play or some, some form of entertainment for these people that you're, are either your jewelers under you or prospects that you're trying to get to have a show for you, maybe get in the business with you. Anytime you're spending money with them on meals and entertainment, it's deductible. And what you need to remember with this is they let you deduct the full, they, they, they let you deduct 50% of the full amount. But where people get confused is they give their accountant that 50% number. That's not what you should do. You should total the, the total number you spent. So if you went to lunch with a prospect, you paid $50 for you and her to go to lunch, you give that full $50, not $25. Your accountant will split it in half for you. But what happens a lot is people think, okay, I can only take 50%, so I'm going to give them $25. Then their accountant thinks it's the full amount, splits it in half again, and they're only taking $12.50. So always give your accountant the full amount for your meals and entertainment. Okay, good to know. Um, now, regarding your home office, um, that's another big one that people know that they can deduct, but they're not sure how. What does that mean? Yep, and it used to be in the past, it was so, they made it so complicated that people just didn't even want to bother with it. You used to have to, to keep track of all your utilities in your entire house, de deduct or divide your square footage of your office, divide it by your home, then take that percentage of, the square, yeah. of your utilities, and yeah, it's, it's just as confusing as it sounds. So a lot of people just didn't bother with it. So this year, in a rare act of common sense by the IRS, they've actually <laughs> made it very simple. Now all you have to do is figure out the square footage of your office, and you get $5 per square foot. So the office that you're sitting in right now, if it was a 200-square-foot office, you're going to get a $1,000 deduction. It's very simple. It's an awesome deduction, and now it's very easy for people to take. Okay, now regarding that office, I know you have said there's stipulations to that. Can you yep. kind of go over what is considered your office? Yeah, because it is something that the IRS monitors pretty closely because people do take advantage of it. And what they say is it has to be a room that's used exclusively for business. So you can't just have a guest room that you throw a computer in and say, that's my home office. You can't uh, have it the, the kids' playroom and put a computer in and say it's the home office. It has to be like like people can see your office from this camera shot. There's it's dedicated to your office. Now you may be watching your grandkids and have toys in there and playing with them in there. That's fine, but it has to be pretty much used exclusively for business. And one thing you may want to do is. When, as soon as you set it up or b in the beginning of the year, take a picture of it. So if the IRS were to question you, you have this picture saying, look, this was an office. Okay, perfect. And so you can say that because we have Skype before when Kiki, me, have had my grandbabies playing in my office. So, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. Regarding auto, I know that there are really two different methods, if I understand right. Can you go over what those are and which one you personally think is tends to be the most advantageous. Yep. So there are two different options. The first option, and it's going to be just as confusing as I'm going to make it sound, okay? So you have to you have to track all of your expenses with your car. 
So every time you fill up your gas tank, you have to save the receipt. Every time you get your oil changed, you have to fill up the receipt. Every time you have a repair, save the receipt. Every time you change your tires, save the receipt. Anything you're doing with your car, save all those receipts. Then take the amount of business miles you drove versus personal miles. Take that percentage, multiply it by those total expenses, and that's the amount you can deduct. And I know that sounded confusing. You may not even have followed it, and it's just <laughs> as confusing as it sounds, okay? The second method, which I highly recommend most people take, all you have to do is track your business miles, and then you take the standard mileage rate by the IRS, which is 55 and a half cents this year, and you get that percentage. So if you drove 10,000 miles for business, you just send that 10,000 miles to your CPA, they'll automatically factor it out, and you'll get $5,500 in auto expenses to deduct. So I highly recommend going the standard deduction rate. All you have to do for that is track your business miles. And, and did you, can you, did you say that the best way you suggest to track that? Yep. So the best way to do this is to get a mileage log for your car. And you have to have one for each car. A lot of people, I know the husband and wife will have each have a car, and the wife will take different cars for shows at different times. You have to have a separate mileage log for each car you use. And what you're going to do is all it has to show is where you went, what the purpose was, how many miles you drove, and the date. So right now, if you drove to Walmart today, it would say 129 2014 went to Walmart to buy printer ink. 25 miles each way, so 50 total miles driven. And you're going to want to use that every time you go on a business trip. And if you're watching this and you say, oh, I've never done that before, you're not alone. 90% of business owners don't do this, but it is something that's very important. If you're one of the unlucky few who gets audited by the IRS, it'll get, it's a get out of jail free card if you have that, if you have that mileage log. Oh, awesome. Okay, so now tell me, um, do we have to report jewelry show profits? And if so, how do we um, determine what the show profit is? Yep, so when you have a jewelry show, the amount that you're going to have to pay taxes on is the total amount that you receive for your show. So if you had a $1,000 show, they, they gave you $1,000. You, you subtract the value of the jewelry, which is usually 50%, correct? Mm -hmm. So you subtract that $500, you had a $500 show. Okay. If you had a $400 show, you subtract the $200 in jewelry, you had $200 in profit. So that's all you need to do for that. A lot of people make the mistake of trying to subtract their other expenses, like their supplies they had to bring, their mileage. Don't do that. You need to list those separately in the expenses like we already talked about. Don't, don't, give your, your, don't list that in your profit. For your profit, all you want is the total value of the show minus your jewelry value. Okay, excellent. Now talk to us about child care and the deductions we can get from that. Yeah, and this is a big one because this is an actual credit, not a deduction. And that's a tax talk way of saying it's a bigger, bigger refund. So what they'll do is if you bring your kids to daycare, you can get a credit for a portion of what you're paying that daycare. If you have a babysitter and they're over the age of 18, you're also going to get that same credit. And what you need to do to track that if you go to daycare, they're going to be able to give you a tax form at the end of the year that has all the information you need. If you have a babysitter that's over 18, you're going to need their social security number, you're going to need their address, and you're going to need the amount you paid them. You might want to give them a heads up that you're going to report that because they're going to be taxed on that. But that, that only works if they're over 18. Okay, If you're having your 16-year-old your neighbor watch them, you don't get that credit. So that, that's an important thing to note there. Okay. Now, what about paying our children to work for us? How old do they have to be, and how does that work? What do we yeah. pay them? Yep. This is a great strategy. So they, they have to be over the age of seven, seven or older, and you have to be actually having them do something. So you can't just say, oh, I paid my kid $500 to, to file these papers. You actually have to track what you're doing. So say I, I had my eight-year-old son file some papers for me for two hours, and I paid him $10 an hour. Okay. And what that does is you, that's a business expense for you. So if you paid him $500 for the year, that's $500 less you're paying in taxes, and he doesn't have to claim it because it's under $600. If it's over $600, your kid will have to, your ch child will have to file a tax return, but they'll be paying at a significantly lower rate than you are. So this is a great strategy to lower your tax rate. And the other cool thing about this is you can actually use the money you pay them to set up a retirement account for them. Because in order to have a retirement account, you have to have earned income. Now they have earned income. You can pay them $500, put all $500 in a retirement account for them because what eight-year-old needs a $500 check, right? 
So mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're accomplishing two goals. You're, you're getting a deduction in your business, and you're getting a retirement account going for them, which we all know is a huge problem. People aren't saving enough for retirement. So how cool to get them going at eight years old or 10 years old or whatever. That's true. Now, would it work if you took that same money and set up a college fund? Absolutely. Yep, you can. So did take the, take the $500 earned, the $1,000 they earned, put it in a 529 college plan, and just let it grow. Oh, awesome. Okay, so now, as you can see, I have a little, um, I have a little, someone who's joined us. This is Ruby Jewel Pearl. Um, okay, so Josh, you know, Premier's are really generous. They offer us, you know, trips that we can earn, and they reward us with free jewelry. Um, why are these considered income, and how can we lessen our liability in these areas by using them as deductions? Yeah, or so, by using deductions. Yeah, unfortunately, the IRS does consider these free trips and jewelry as income. Okay, you may not have received money from Premier, but they say, well, that trip that they gave you has a monetary value, and we're going to tax you on that. So the way it works is Premier will say, okay, we gave Kathy a free cruise. That cruise is valued at a thousand dollars. So they're going to report a thousand dollars of income to the IRS. And that's not something you have to track. That's something that Premier will track for you. They'll issue you a 1099 at the end of the year that you just give to your accountant, and they'll figure that out. But it is something you want to monitor because there are expenses you can take to offset that. So when you go on those trips, all your costs to get there, all your hotel costs, your airfare, your driving, your meals, all of that stuff, we're going to use as expenses to offset that. Does that make sense? Yes. Now let me ask you this. Um, for those of us in Premier who have a team, and if we earn jury certificates, but then we decide to um, run contests or reward our girls and um, give them free jewelry, how does that work? Can we then, instead of that certificate being considered an income, can we then offset that by yep. Yep. running contests or whatever? Yep, absolutely. So there's a few ways you can do this. Um, the IRS lets you give a $25 gift to any person okay, and deduct it. So if it's less than $25 that you're giving someone, just list it as a gift. If it's more than that, we're going to have to call it something else, whether it's a hostess incentive or a contest for your girls. And that's something you'll want to talk with your CPA about specifically what to do. But we don't just want to call it a donation or a gift because they are there are limits on how you can deduct that. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, okay. Now, now uh, a couple other questions that they've had is, what if somebody works a full-time job and they're self-employed? Um, how does that work then for them, their taxes? Yeah. So it's actually no different, really. Um, it's all going to be reported on your your 1040 in some way. It's just various forms you have to use. And again, we go back to why you should hire a qualified person to prepare it for you. They'll figure that all out for you. All you have to do is give them your information. But the short answer is there's there's nothing to worry about there. It doesn't complicate things. It's it's okay. it's not a problem. Okay. Now let's talk about um, dependents. Is there an age limit on claiming our children as a dependent? Yep. So if, as long as they're in school, you can claim them up to 24 years old. So if after high school they go to college, you can continue to claim them up to 24 years old. If they don't go to school after high school, you can claim them up to 19 years old. Okay? As long okay. as you're still providing at least half the support for them, you can continue to claim them all those years. The one thing that you have to watch is only one person can claim that child. So if you claim them, they can't claim themselves. You can actually file a tax return and not claim yourself. And where we see a lot of people run into trouble, especially if they have uh, ch- children in college, is their, their child will go to prepare their own taxes, not tell their mom and dad, claim themselves. Then all of a sudden the parents go to do the tax return and it gets rejected because the kid they're trying to claim already claimed themselves. So the best strategy is to either have your, your child go to the same person you're going to or to really communicate with them and say, listen, you can go do your own tax return, but you can't claim yourself. Okay. So. Now, and then how much does an unmarried dependent student have to make before he or she um, should file an income tax? Yep. So the IRS says you have to file a tax return if you make over the standard deduction, which is about $6,000 this year. So if they made over that, they have to file a return. If they made under that, it's probably in their best interest to still file a return because even if you're claiming them, they will still get all of it back, everything they paid in back if they made under six or under $6,000. So I would recommend any anyone who earned income file a tax return. Okay. Now um, talk to us about the different types of filing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can. there's a few ways you can file. You can file single. 
This would be if you're not married and you had no dependents. You can file head of household. This would be if you're single and have a dependent. You can file married filing jointly, which would be if you're married and you and your husband or wife are filing together. Or you can file married filing separately. Um, and this would be if for some reason you and your spouse wanted to file separately. That's usually, there's almost never a benefit to doing that. Every once in a while there is. Um, if you're going to a CPA, they'll be able to put in all your information and tell you whether it's better to file jointly or separately. But for a general rule, it's always better to file jointly. And then finally, there, there's one more. Uh, if you've had a spouse pass away this year, the IRS will let you file as what's called a qualifying widow for the next two years, which is basically the same as filing married. So those are, those are the filing statuses. They, they make a bigger difference than you'd imagine. One thing to note that the biggest mistake is going between single and head of household. If you're single and you have a child that your spouse is claiming, you can still file as head of household for that child, even though you're not claiming him. Or if you have a parent that you're taking care of, you can file head of household. So head of household is a big difference over single. It's if you have any chance that you can claim it, you, you want to be able to do it. Okay, good to know. Um, speaking on that, talk to us about, um, I had a girl call the other day, um, she knows you're a CPA, so she thought that I might be knowledgeable in this area. <laughs> Anyways, she, um, her and her husband separated, and she said now they're separated, they separated last year, does that mean they file separately? So can you kind of address the divorced and separated situation? Yep, so it's actually a pretty simple rule. The IRS considers your status to be what you were on December 31st at 11.59 p.m., okay? So if you get divorced on December 31st, you are considered single for the entire year. If you get married on December 31st, you are considered married for the entire year. It doesn't matter what you spent most of the time as, it's what you were on that day. Now there is one exception to this. If you have been legally separated for at least six months of the year, you can have the choice of filing as married or single. That's the only exception there is. Otherwise, just go by what you were at the last day of the year. Okay, great. And then, Josh, talk to us about um, quarterly payments. Like, how do we know if or when we should file quarterly, you know, individual estimated tax payments? Yep, and this causes a lot of business owners stress because they hear other business owners talking about paying their quarterlies, and they say, well, I didn't pay quarterlies. Am I going to be in trouble? <laughs> it's, it's not something to really worry about, okay? First of all, the IRS says you have to make those quarterlies if your business owes at least $1,000 in taxes. Now, I'm sure most of the people saying, re watching this right now are saying, well, I have no idea if my business is going to cause $1,000 in taxes. So there is a loophole here that the IRS lets you get out of this. If you pay in at least as much as you owed last year, you don't have to worry about estimated taxes. And where this is helpful is if you have a job outside of Premier or if your husband has a job, they're withholding taxes on your paycheck. And almost 100% of the time, they're withholding enough to cover that amount that you owed last year. So you're going to be safe. So if you or your spouse have a job outside of Premier, I would not worry about estimated taxes right now. Um, if you don't have a job, I still wouldn't worry about it until you start making at least $20,000 in profit. Once you get to that point, talk to a CPA. They'll figure out your quarterlies for you. As part of your tax return, they, they can figure that out for you. But if you haven't made them this year, don't stress over it. It's not a big deal. Okay, good to know. Um, all right, and then let me ask you this. Red flags, you know, Everybody's afraid of the IRS. They're afraid of getting audited. Are there areas we need to be careful to avoid attracting attention to the IRS in an audit? Yeah, there are a few things that will uh, get, catch the IRS's attention. First of all, you're business owners, okay? So there, there's so many tax advantages to business owners that they're going to look at you a little bit more closely. Now, the chances of you getting audited are still extremely low, less than 2%. So it's not something you want to stress over, but it's something you want to keep in mind and make sure everything's in line, okay? But there are a few areas specifically that they'll look at. Um, one is meals and entertainment. That's one people abuse a lot. So you're going to want to make sure that you're accurately giving the right amount. If you have $20,000 in income, don't report $10,000 in meals and entertainment expenses. They're, they're not going to believe that, okay? <laughs> so make that a reasonable amount. Um, another one is auto. We already talked about it. The key is to keep a log. If you have that, you're fine. Um, and the third one, we already talked about, the home office deduction. As long as you're using a room that's actually used for business, again, you're fine. Maybe take a picture of it like we talked about to prove that it's always been an office. But 
when it comes to an audit, you don't have to be scared if you're doing things the right way. The people who need to be scared of an audit are the people who are lying or the people who haven't documented their stuff. Like we talked about in the beginning, the biggest rule of the IRS is documentation, documentation, documentation. Keep your receipts. Keep everything you have. And when it comes to receipts, your, your credit card statement can actually act as your receipt. So you don't have to have a shoebox full of everything you spent if you have that credit card statement showing what you spent. So just keep tell the truth, keep your, your documents, and then you have nothing to worry about with an audit. Okay, now speaking of that, is it better for us to keep our receipts monthly or to keep them more in categories like, yep. you know, cell phone and auto and office? Yep, exactly. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but always keep them categorized by the expense that they're in, the, the office supplies, the auto. Don't be, put a big, I spent $5,000 last month. Always keep them okay. uh, by category. That's how the IRS will want to see them. And then is there, you know, this, I'm just wondering this myself. So is there an advantage if you're audited and you are having a professional CPA prepare it versus being audited on your own? Yep, that is one of the big advantages because the, the biggest concern with an audit, if you're doing things the right way, is just the time that you're going to spend proving that you're telling the truth. When you have a CPA, a lot of times you can tell the IRS to just talk to your CPA. You can send the t CPA the documents they need and you don't even really have to be involved. And even if you don't want the CPA to handle it directly, they can at least walk you through what you're going to need to show the IRS. So either way, it's going to cut time on what you need for an IRS audit. And you have someone who knows what they're doing on, exactly. you know, representing you on your behalf. So exactly. that's cool. Okay, gosh, Josh, thank you so much for all this information. Now, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, whether it's just for a 15-minute ask you questions, decide what to do, or whether they want to, um, you know, um, ask you to represent them as their CPA, how do they go about getting in touch with you? Yeah, so the best way I would say is to get on our website. Um, it's cpajdb.com. If, if, if you're having trouble remember that's just CPA Just Doing Business, cpajdb.com. And what we'll have there, we'll have contact forms where you can contact us. We also have a lot of articles there that will help you get your taxes ready, help you throughout the year with your tax strategy. So a lot of free resources there that you can use. And then also you can just email me directly, cpajdb at gmail.com. Okay, awesome. Well, for those of you who don't know, Josh and his beautiful wife, Courtney, my daughter-in-law, are expecting their first baby. I should say babies because they have two little twin boys that are going to be coming any day. And this grandma, known as Kiki, is beside herself. She can hardly wait. Well, as, so, as, honey. As a CPA, I had to uh, make my wife get double the tax deduction. <laughs> there you go. Of course you did. So um, we are praying for those little babies. And thank you so much, Josh, for this time and for your um, willingness to serve. Really appreciate it. Very, very helpful. Yeah, uh, happy to help. Even if people don't want to use me on their taxes, they just have a few questions here and there. Just feel free to email me. I'm happy to help. Perfect. Thanks, honey. Love you and love my girl, Courtney. Can't wait to hear about those babies. Have a great day. <laughs>